Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. BBC World Service and the final part in our series, Spanning the World, which explores the significance of bridges around the globe. In this programme, we visit London Bridge, versions of which have spanned the River Thames for centuries, and examine how one of London's most famous landmarks crossed continents and ended up in Arizona. Isn't it a weird place? If you look in the middle of the desert, all of a sudden there's a lot of water around us. Just desert. The next city is about an hour driving. And all of a sudden there's London Bridge. It's out of this world. Spanning the world. London Bridge. Excuse me if I go first. <laughs> uh, I'm Ruth Bryden. I'm the curator of the Lake Havasu Museum of History in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We'll start. That. Oh, I'll start here. Uh, these pictures were commissioned by an art gallery in New York at the time the bridge was dedicated here. And the artists are from England, other parts of Europe, Canada, the United States. And I love these. Like, for example, none of them had seen it here. (laughs) But here you have the Lord Mayor standing by the water skiers with Queen Victoria, Lady Godiva, I think that's Shakespeare, all standing at the end of the bridge. (laughs) I crossed the bridge in London in 1959, (laughs) but uh, I first saw it here in 1989 when I came. And... I loved it. Loved it in London and love it here. Now, this gives you an idea uh, of the costumes. We have a milkmaid's costume. We have all kinds of things which are are fun. But uh, they date, a lot of them are from the era when the bridge was built in England. It just brings back a sense of history when you see a bridge and know that there'd been a bridge at about that point on the Thames since, what, 43 A.D. with the Romans? A pontoon bridge, but nonetheless, this, that was the idea. And so I just, uh, I, I love the sense of history that comes with it. In the 1960s, there's the beginning of the construction of the new London Bridge we have today, and the Rennie Bridge is dismantled and shifted off to America. The, the, the modern bridge is not the beauty that the um, Rennie Bridge was. It, it, it doesn't have the grace. And the, the, the current crossing, it's, it's a very functional thing. We, we're standing on the north shore of London Bridge, which is it's actually more interesting, I think, than the southern shore, because it was never really redeveloped. You can still walk down a stairway to get actually into the river itself, which would have, would have been once access to river boats and crossings. So there's a feel of old London, even though this is a very modern modern bridge and motorway flyover almost. My name's Chris Roberts, I'm a, a London writer and tour guide and uh, as, as, as a South Londoner, a transpontine as we were once described, the bridges and crossing points of the Thames are very important to me and I spend a lot of time walking along the foreshore and crossing the bridges to uh, see how they are now, how they've changed and how they've changed the city over the centuries is something that really interests me. The Romans were interested in using the tidal river and London Bridge, their London Bridge, was the first spot where you had firm land on the north side and the south side. The Thames itself is a really important symbolic barrier because even before the Romans, the tribes to the south of the Thames uh, were at war with the tribes to the north. Um, After the Romans, you had the the Kingdom of Mercia and to the south you had the Saxon Kingdoms. And if you you want to carry it right to the present day, on the south side you've got Millwall, on the north side you've got West Ham. Either way, you've got hundreds of years of enmity across this river. And London Bridge, it kind of funnels all of that focus into it. Standing on the bridge, even in the present day, I think that the division of London by this river is socially far more powerful than anyone ever acknowledges unless they stop to think about it.
my name is Colin Slee. The full title is the Very Reverend Colin Slee, Dean of Southwark. Sometimes people tell me they don't know where Southwark Cathedral is, which always leaves me shocked and horrified. Southwark Cathedral is the oldest cathedral church in London. It's on the southern end of London Bridge. The River Thames is the most extraordinarily powerful geographical divide, but it's actually a hugely significant social divide as well, and that's very clearly represented in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries when the frightfully respectable burghers of the City of London didn't want anything that might be in the least bit doubtful or sinful to be happening in the city, but they said it could all happen on this side of the river. So what actually happened, because we were outside the jurisdiction, was that on this side of the river all the unpleasant trades occurred, like leather tanning and leather selling, and all the nasty polluting trades were this side of the river. The other thing that was this side of the river were what they thought were all the nasty uh, polluting social practices. So there were theatres, there was bear baiting, there was gambling, there were brothels known as stews and licensed by the Bishop of Winchester, which I maintain is why the Diocese of Winchester has so much money. So it was a very dubious neighbourhood in which Shakespeare and Chaucer and all of those wonderful characters of English literature um, grew up and practised their trades. On the current London Bridge on the south side, there's a giant white spike, which is basically a memorial to the unknown traitor. And it wasn't just traitors who put it, it was criminals as well, but it tended to be political rebels, so... Um, William Wallace was, was, an early, was an early head to be put on there. Uh, Jack Cabe, the Kentish rebel, was another one that was put on there. And it was a warning because Southwark, the, the borough, the ward without the city, that's part of London but not part of London, that had its own laws where prostitution was legal and gambling and bear baiting and many other delights that Londoners would cross the water for, either by boat or over the bridge. There was this lawlessness on the south side and the bridge, by having the heads of the traitors and the criminals on it, was almost warning people. It was almost saying, OK, you can muck around here on the south side, but once you cross over to the city, we have laws and if you're not careful, your head will end up on there. When we bring kids through, they absolutely love this picture. These are the heads of people who have been beheaded, and they think that's rather neat. <laughs> people believe there are ghosts around the bridge that maybe traveled from London down here. In the buildings around it at night, they often see something in the window, a lady in, 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 in a certain dress. And there is a rumor Jack the Ripper had something to do with it. What was that movie called, the one about Jack the Ripper? Years ago, there was some blood dropped, and then the blood came to life. So It was a horror movie almost, but <laughs> came to life, and he came out of it, and then he was killing people in Lake Havasu City. We had a guy who knew a lot about it. He had a ghost tour, but he, he turned himself into a ghost. He left, and, and we don't have that ghost tour anymore, but we have still the stories. The recent one is... Terror Piranha. of London Bridge. Terror on London Bridge, yes, I think, that was it. the one, yeah. The latest movie's called Piranha. Is, is the bridge... The bridge is in I don't know if the bridge the is... The park is in that a lot. But this is where giant piranhas are eating people uh, and such. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have to wait and see where the bridge is involved. Yeah. I have some pictures. I took that ghost tour, and um, have you ever heard of orbs? These are the little round things you see in the picture. I had the biggest orbs in that picture, and it looked like they were flying. He told me these were the ghosts of, of deceased people. If it's true, I don't know. We're heading down to the actual lip of the river now, the River Thames, and it's starting to become incredibly disgusting. It is very hellish when you come down here. It's, it's the very sort of guts of London Bridge. I'm Alex MacDonald, I'm a poet and I work and live in London and I have a huge interest in T.S. Eliot. This is the first section of the wasteland called The Burial of the Dead. It's the last stanza and this is where he introduces the idea of London Bridge. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, 
A crowd flowed over London Bridge. So many I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eye before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street to where St Mary Walnuth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. On the bridge every day there are, as it were, two tidal flows. There is the immensely powerful tidal flow of the river, which is at this point travelling east-west. The other tidal flow is the north-south, and it is equally impressive from the south to the north in the mornings and from the north to the south in the evenings, which obviously matches the commuter times and it's actually quite hard to enter London Bridge Station against the flow. T.S. Eliot worked around this area. He used to work in Bank, which is a heavily financial district of London. He worked underground, right underneath the pavement, so every day there'd be this constant walking sound and it would drive him absolutely insane. These sounds were reverberating around his head and I suppose that's why he focused on this constant amount of people walking over and to the bridge. He uses the bridge in quite an interesting way. He, in fact, alludes to a section of Dante's Inferno, the part of the Divine Comedy which maps the poet's ascension from hell to heaven. He references this part in Dante where all these people are walking forward, keeping their eyes on their feet. These people in Dante's Inferno were the dispossessed. There was no salvation for them. There's a lovely quote from a historian, Mr Wheeler, who, who basically says that London is a parasite on the bridge. There is no, no bridge, no city, quite, quite simple. And there, there's something to that. For centuries, it was the only solid crossing on the Thames, and the city of London fought to keep it that way. They, they bribed governments, they bribed kings, they would do anything to stop other bridges being built on the Thames. It funnelled all the trade into their coffers, into their part of the... Thames Valley, if you like. Westminster Bridge, 1750, changes absolutely everything. And at this point, there's a rival close to the city. And that's the point when London starts to assume its modern shape. The old walls of the city begin to be taken down. Old London Bridge is cleared of housing. Blackfriars Bridge is built very quickly. And suddenly you have all these bridges dotted along the Thames. And the, the, the idea of, a, of this walled city that has existed in Roman times and then again from the, from the Norman times onwards suddenly starts to crumble and the, the city expands. <laughs> do I have to or do I absolutely have to? Okay. <laughs> London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down. My fair lady. Do you not know them? I don't know that part. Forgot it. <laughs> I know that part. I know. Awesome. <laughs> in 1820, thereabouts, they start to demolish old London Bridge, the famous London Bridge, the one with the nursery rhyme, the whole with the churches on it where people were buried, people lived for centuries. Uh, and it was falling down. This notion of nursery rhyme, they did have to keep building it up. It kept falling down, apart and falling, falling into the river down, and being patched down. up. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. Build it up with sticks and stones, sticks and stones, sticks and stones. Build it up with sticks and stones, my fair lady. Now, do you? I'm Steve Roud. I'm a writer, folklorist, particularly interested in folklore, folk songs and children's folklore. People seem to think that nursery rhymes have to have a hidden meaning. And the other belief is that they are very old, whereas most nursery rhymes aren't that old. And very few of them, if any, have a secret meaning. Some people say that that song actually came from about the year 1000 when there were still wooden bridges on the Thames. One of the legends about London Bridge and London Bridge is falling down and this notion of keeping a man to watch all night is that there was a sacrifice to the bridge. The Vikings came up trying to capture London. They went up and took a cable and attached it on the piers and then rode like mad downstream and pulled the bridge down. It isn't true with London Bridge, but there are examples of buildings being consecrated by people or people's shadows or animals. And some people say that uh, 
that that was the origin of that song. I don't know. You hear different stories. London Bridge is falling down, one of the most popular rhymes in the world, I would say. The usual theory there is that in the old days, in sort of unspecified pagan times, when you're building a bridge, you had to have a human sacrifice. So therefore you would bury somebody alive under the bridge. That's, that's the theory. The problem with all of these theories is that they take no account of the history of the rhyme itself. Now, in fact, London Bridge is falling down. The first text that we've got, the first reference to the words, are 1744. You know, that's a thousand years after Christianity came to, to Britain. So if you're presuming that the song goes back to pagan times, you've got to presume that the song existed but was not recorded for a thousand years, which is fairly unlikely. I think the, the rhyme itself is simply that. There is no hidden meaning. It's a children's rhyme. Americans would say I'm Jan Cassis, but it's Jan Cassis. I'm the director of visitor services of the Convention and Visitors Bureau. I said it all. But I'm most of the time working in the visitor center at Lake Havasu City. And we are so close to London Bridge. We see a lot of people who come in here and, and are surprised and people are fighting about it. This is not a real bridge. And we have to make peace every now and then. A lot of people come in and tell me, you know what, I walked on, on this bridge in London too. And there is not one, there are hundreds of them, and I am always surprised. <laughs> I think you have to come up with a diploma or something. I walked this bridge in two different continents or something. Hmm, maybe that's a good idea. Some veterans th that have been stationed in England uh, during the war are, are very excited about it. There's even, and maybe we can look at it later, there is some a graffiti that is put there for someone who was in, in the army, and it's still on the bridge. Oh, here it is. You see it? I see Sergeant Fitzmaier and Private Smith. They must have been sitting here, and above it it says 42, 1942. Can you imagine? People sitting under this bridge making this little inscription. Maybe they were there for World War II. I don't know if they are British or, or American. But this has always intrigued me. Because if you see a bridge, a bridge has to do with people too. It's, it's not just a bridge. A bridge is made by, it's made by people, it's used by people. People have been sitting under the bridge. Maybe some young people have been kissing under the bridge. Who knows some babies were made under the bridge? That's, that's what always intrigues me about old building, what has happened before. Well, this bridge has seen a lot. Early 19th century, John Rennie builds a beautiful bridge. Gorgeous thing. She's now in Arizona. Um, exported as a large antique in 10,000 pieces. I'm very familiar with the story that uh, when the Rennie London Bridge was demolished, it was bought by an American and taken and put up where it still remains, in the middle of an artificial lake in Arizona. And the story that runs, I have to say, this side of the Atlantic, that they thought they'd bought Tower Bridge. I have to say I don't believe the story, I can't believe any multimillionaire would be so foolish as to buy an entire bridge without checking out which bridge he's talking about. I remember thinking at the time, independently, I bet he thinks he's bought Tower Bridge. <laughs> All right. We found the copies of the local newspaper. This particular one is the year that the bridge was dedicated here. Let me see if I can find an article on this. After a 10,000-mile journey across the sea and land, the historic London Bridge will open in Lake Havasu City at 11 a.m. on Sunday, October 10, 1971. 
The reason it was being sold in London was that it was slowly sinking into the Thames. Also, it was nowhere near adequate for the amount of traffic that was needed on it. And any pictures you see are just crowded. And so that is why they decided that they were going to have to tear it down and put up another bridge. And so they put a prospectus out on it. And that's what Mr. McCullough saw. McCullough manufactured outboard motors among other things, and he needed a lake, a freshwater lake, to test them. So he was looking for that, and he flew around the west and found Lake Havasu and thought, ah, this is perfect. So he bought what was a fishing camp at that time, and then he decided that this was a good place for a city. He was very much the old-fashioned entrepreneur. McCullough was looking for a gimmick to publicize Lake Havasu City and therefore sell land. And so the purchase of the bridge was purely an advertising uh, gimmick. A lot of people from London think that McCullough was duped into buying it and paying so much money and this, but, but he was crazy like a fox. He sold thousands of lots by having you know, the bridge here and attracted people to come. And once they got here, then they would see the beauty of the lake and the weather and the, the, that, and then they would buy a lot. About three years ago, I was in a taxi in London and said, well, you know that he didn't get the bridge he thought he was buying. And I told him, oh, yes, he did. He had a prospectus and everything. I can imagine that Mr. McCullough might have replied, oh, no, that, that was a big surprise to me because he was a big joker. He loved to to say funny things and so on. And so he might have said something like that, I don't know. I, and no doubt hundreds of others in this neighbourhood, encounter tourists from all countries, not just the United States, asking where London Bridge is, and we say to them, well, you're standing next to it or on it or whatever, and they look perplexed. And one knows perfectly well that they're really talking about Tower Bridge. I walk across the bridge fairly often. I come across a bus and I take little notice of it at all. Spanning the World was produced by Eleanor McDowell. It's just a bridge. I mean, that's all you can say about it. Whereas Tower Bridge or somewhere in Venice or something, you could recognise a picture of it. It was a falling tree production for the BBC World Service. Somebody showed me a picture of London Bridge which is probably the bridge I go over most in my life, I wouldn't recognise it. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.